Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Quantitative Profiling of the Intrinsic Pathway of Apoptosis in Tumor Tissue Using Myriad RBM's Multiplex Apoptosis Map. My name is Andrew Jernan, and I'll be your XTalks host. And at this point, I would like to thank Myriad RBM, who has helped develop the content for this presentation. Now, Myriad RBM is the world's leading multiplex amino assay testing laboratory, providing comprehensive protein biomarker services based on its multi-analyte profiling map technology platform. This platform provides preclinical and clinical researchers with reproducible and quantitative data for a few or hundreds of proteins in a cost-effective manner. Uh, to learn more, visit www.myriadrbm.com. And another thanks goes to BioRad Laboratories. Bio, BioRad Laboratories has remained at the center of scientific discovery for more than 50 years, manufacturing and distributing a broad range of products for the life science research and clinical diagnostics markets. The company is renowned worldwide among hospitals, universities, major research institutions, as well as biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies for its commitment to quality and customer service. Founded in 1952, BioRad is headquartered in Hercules, California, and serves more than 100,000 research and industry customers worldwide through its global network of operations. And now I would like to introduce our speaker for today's event, and that is Dominic Isinger, PhD. Dr. Isinger currently serves as the Director of Strategic Development for Myriad RBM as part of the business and scientific management team. Prior to joining Myriad RBM, he was president of Multiplex Biosciences, a multiplex immunoassay development and manufacturing company. Dr. Isinger has also held previous management positions in R&D related to multiplex immunoassay development, molecular biology, and tumor vaccine antigen discovery. He has over 17 years of industry experience in various scientific and commercialization roles and is a noted international authority on protein arrays. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to Dr. Isinger. You can begin your presentation when ready. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And this should be a fun, interactive, looking forward to your questions at the end of this. So as you can see, the title here is Quantitative Profiling of the Intrinsic Pathway of Apoptosis in Tumor Tissue Using Our Multiplex Apoptosis Map. My talk will be broken down into four parts. Uh, a brief company overview, an overview of our multiplex services and value, and then about the technology platform, which is really unique here. We've taken what has traditionally been wet measured by Western blot and applied it to a multiplex platform for much higher levels of quantification, including validation and quality. And then most of the talk will evolve around the apoptosis measurement, an overview of apoptosis, and the applications of how this apoptosis map service can be used for research and drug development and discovery needs. So a little bit about us. So Myriad RBM is a service business. We test your samples in our reference lab. We have a menu of over 400 human and rodent protein biomarkers. And all of this is done with quantitative multiplexing. And this is fully automated liquid handling. So we've brought this platform to clinical laboratory standards. And because of multiplexing and the automation, we need very small sample volumes, which can be extremely precious in applications such as clinical trials. So in this talk, you'll hear about our partnership with BioRad. So this really got started to measure apoptosis um, as a partnership that we had with the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis to develop a quantitative multiplex panel of apoptosis biomarkers targeting the pathway in order to support proof of mechanism studies for investigational agents that modulate apoptosis. So a big difference between Myriad, RBM, and BioRad here is these assays are available as a service through Myriad RBM. You send us frozen tissues. 
or extracted tissues and samples, and we do the analysis and turn around data for you. Alternatively, if you want to do it yourself, these exact kits are available on the BioPlex platform. BioRad has the most extensive platform for this multiplex Luminex XMAP technology, and this set of products is part of the BioPlex Pro RBM apoptosis assays. So you really have two choices here, to run kits in-house, to do it yourself, or send your samples out and have Myriad RBM test it for you. So a little bit about Myriad RBM. We were founded in 1998 as a division of Luminex, Luminex being the company that made this XMAP multiplex technology, which I'll talk a little bit more about during the technology section. RBM spun out of Luminex in 2002 to take proprietary multiplex immunoassays that had applications in both research, clinical, and drug development markets. And we have a, phar have a pharmaceutical services business that provides testing for pharma, biotech, and uh, academic and government researchers. We're headquartered in Austin, Texas, and that's where our reference laboratory is. We have over 150 full-time employees. In May 31, 2011, we were purchased by Myriad Genetics, and we changed our name to Myriad RBM. Many of you may be familiar with Myriad Genetics, uh, famous for breast cancer, hereditary gene testing, BRCA testing, and all sorts of other prognostic tests around oncology. So we were seen as the leaders in protein uh, quantification for future diagnostic and companion diagnostic applications, and that's what we are doing with Myriad. Uh, briefly, some of our services. So we, we use this terminology MAP, which really stands for multi-analyte profile. So we have some of our assays divided into different therapeutic areas, such as our human maps around oncology, inflammation, metabolic, uh, kidney tox toxicity. And these are really around secreted and shed proteins that are detectable in fluids and blood. And the apoptosis map here is going to be quite unique in that we're really looking at intracellular proteins where tissues and cells need to be lysed. So it's a brand new sort of product area for us. And a big popular uh, set of our maps are custom maps where we customize the individual assays that somebody wants. So now let's talk a little bit about the technology. Many of you may be familiar with it. And it's nothing more than sandwich immunoassays and competitive immunoassays coupled to the surface of polystyrene micron beads, five micron beads in diameter, that are differentially dyed, with each different color bead having a particular capture antibody that sets the specificity for the reaction. So when these beads are mixed, uh, multiplex immunoassays are possible. And then these beads go through a flow cytometry cell and are interrogated simultaneously by two lasers, one laser quantifying the amount of analyte and the other laser identifying the reaction, whether it's TNF-alpha, insulin, or IL-6. So this is the basis of the Luminex or XMAP technology. Uh, the BioRad, probably the largest distributor of this technology, um, is the brand is BioPlex, and we can see the three major instruments here, MagPix, BioPlex 200, and the BioPlex 3D. So BioRad offers a full suite from software, service and support, to wash stations to carry out the assay, and then uh, assay kits with everything needed to do this, including now the Myriad, the BioPlex Pro multiplex kits. So the Luminex XMAP technology is a diagnostic platform. There's the FDA with cleared instrumentation. There are greater than 50 FDA tests. Now well over 9,000 instruments worldwide and over 10,000 publications citing data. So this is not a new platform. Uh, we're going on over 10 years. It's quite robust and well validated and popular as you can see. So Myriad RBM, we were the first to really fully automate the platform. So all assays are run in our reference laboratory using the Evo TCAN platform, um, robotic platform, uh, with quite a bit of assay development going into blockers to handle matrix effects, 
and validation is guided by the clinical laboratory standards with control and calibrations on each plate. You're looking at a picture here of our more than 60 instruments running in our reference lab, and last year we returned over 6 million data points to customers. So here's an example of a plate design. Um, Eight-point calibration curves on each plate, front and back. Duplicate low, medium, and high controls. And then unknown samples go in the white wells here. And every plate is curve-fitted. Here's an example of a, uh, a calibration curve for VEGF. And you can see the duplicate points here. And then the unknowns from that plate are plotted off red from the actual calibration curves of each plate. So the validation parameters we follow. We follow the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, formerly NCCLS, standard immunodiagnostic validation parameters for an FDA immunodiagnostic test. And these are all the parameters that we report and you can routinely review uh, with the unique one to multiplexing being cross-reactivity. And again, we are a CLIA certified lab and support numerous GLP studies. Um, we use standard immunodiagnostic um, parameters such as Levy-Jennings charts. And what we're looking at here is an assay over 20 runs, and we're looking at the controls in the uh, one and two standard deviations. So over multiple runs and multiple lots, we monitor controls and use a series of West Guard rules to, dot, to make a decision tree when a plate or assay should pass or fail. So let's go into apoptosis now. Uh, we'll go over an overview and then some of the applications and particulars of our apoptosis map. So apoptosis, I think many of you know it's an inc very important in normal physiology, um, in development, immune system maturation, morphogenesis, neural development. Uh, it's key, as we know, how did our fingers become separated? At one point they were webbed and the cells in between our fingers had to undergo apoptosis to, to generate our, our fingers and digits. And uh, it's so tightly regulated and the theme will be here, we're looking at multiple redundant pathways and different players in the pathway um, and I think what you'll see is a theme that you really need to profile different cells to find out potentially which particular members a cell is dependent on. Since it needs to be so tightly regulated because excess apoptosis really leads to neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, whereas deficient apoptosis, if a cell cannot undergo cell death, that is an important part of oncology and cancer development, and also autoimmunity. It's important to know the difference between the two types of cell death. And one term for apoptosis is programmed cell death, whereas necrosis is uncontrolled cell death. So you can see the real differences in these parameters. Where in necrosis, you get swelling, membranes are broken. and apoptosis, membranes are intact. Uh, apoptosis being an active process requires ATP, and necrosis ATP is deleted, depleted. Um, cells lice in necrosis eliciting an inflammatory reaction. In apoptosis, the cell is phagocytized into little compartments, so we don't activate the immune system. It's very controlled. Um, and in vivo, we see whole areas of tissue affected by necrosis. Whereas in apoptosis, just individual cells appear to be affected. So here's a little map showing the extrinsic pathway on the left. And that's typically a, a ligand induced, such as FAS, death receptors um, of the extrinsic. And then the intrinsic pathway is really chemotherapy, um, uh, DNA damaging agents, growth factor withdrawal, which you can see on the right there. Um, and some of the key cell signaling pathways of the ERK pathway, AKT pathway, um, keeping proteins in an inactive state that can block apoptosis. Um, and then a key player for the intrinsic pathway is the mitochondria. So the ultimate signal is if the outer membrane of the mitochondria becomes permalized, 
permeabilized and releases the respiratory protein uh, cytochrome C and SMAC or a Diablo, and they can activate the cascade, cascade apoptosome formation, and then the triggering of the cascade is really uh, not, not stoppable at that point. So there are inhibitors of apoptosis. So I'll go into a little bit throughout the talk, and I'll go through a little bit more of a schematic. Um, but the really some of the key here is the color coding. All of the proteins you see in blue are available through the apoptosis map. Uh, and the yellow are some of the other players also in it. Um, and so uh, a key is the BACs and VAC are sort of the pro-apoptotic proteins. And they form this oligomeric structure and form a large pore on the outer membrane. And that's what really leads to the release of cytochrome C or uh, uh, SMAC Diablo. Uh, so what is very well controlled through heterodimer interactions is preventing backs or back to oligomerize and make this pore formation. So what are some of the applications? Um, oncology is really the biggest one. It is pretty well known that for most tumors that there is some sort of defect in apoptosis. Uh, so there's big applications for solid tumors, uh, hematologic cancers, leukemias, and lymphomas. And because of this technology, a needle biopsy, which can be obtainable from a human with just 100 micrograms of tissue, is enough to quantitate all 14 of these proteins in the apoptosis map. Uh, xenografts, I'll show some data of some xenografts, where we have a human tumor in a mouse. Lots of xenograft really goes on work. Um, and so this is a really great technology for profiling different tumors and treatment regimes in a mouse in a preclinical setting. Uh, there are multiple apoptosis activators in clinical development upwards of phase two. Um, and there's also really good applications for existing chemotherapeutics for diagnostic and companion diagnostic potential. Since uh, profiling the apoptotic pathway and what a tumor is potentially dysregulated or dependent on, could help choose which of the existing chemotherapeutics might be more beneficial for a particular patient. And also inflammatory disease, where apoptosis is dysregulated, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, here's just a couple of the major classes in drug development. Uh, BH3 mimetics, and here are some of the agents. And on the right, you can see there are uh, quite a diverse set of cancers from solid tumors, lymphomas, leukemias, uh, and prostate cancer. And then survivin inhibitors. So survivin is upregulated in just about all cancers, well known to be upregulated. And when survivin is upregulated, it's an inhibitor of apoptosis. So having an inhibitor of survivin might help trigger a cancer cell into apoptosis. And then the third class here of the eight inhibitors of apoptosis antagonists. And we'll show some data from some of these also. Here are the proteins in the three panels, and whether their apoptotic action is pro-apoptotic, uh, anti-apoptotic, or as an end-stage marker, such as laminin B, which is a nuclear intermediate filament. So they're divided into these three panels based on what would multiplex together and which would also help uh, um, decide in some of the areas one might want to look at in apoptosis. An important thing here is here we're able to measure heterodimers. If you look at panel two, number three, uh, there's the BCL2, BCL2 being upregulated in many cancers, uh, backs heterodimers. So when those two are bound, you have an anti-apoptotic effect. Um, so we have worked out very good biochemistry and detergent conditions to be able to detect physiological heterodimers. And when uh, the heterodimers are released by BH3 proteins and back, back is able to ligamerize, again, that would lead to apoptosis. Uh, and then including uh, in panel two, the active caspase, when we know apoptosis has been initiated. So we'll go back to a little schematic again. So this would be a typical cell where apoptosis is inhibited. Um, I'll go over some of the proteins here. You can see SMAC is uh, uh, within the mitochondria. 
uh, and the important pro-apoptotic proteins BAX and BAC are all complexed in a heterodimeric form with BCL2 member family members. Um, and then you can see the, pro, the caspases are in their pro form, inactive. Uh, Survivin is there. And then if we go to the next slide and we see an activation, so now we have BAC uh, home oligomeric complexes and BAC. Um, and uh, BAD, a BH3 protein is displaced. The uh, anti-apoptotic BCL2, MCL1, allowing BAC and BAC to uh, oligomerize and release SMAC into the cytoplasm. And that's where SMAC and cytochrome C can, in, uh, let's say, by binding survive and uh, release the caspases. First caspase 9 can be activated and caspase 3. So this is some of what happens. And by looking at what we'll see here in our protocols is really looking at cytosolic and then membrane fat fractions, both nuclear and mitochondrial. Where these proteins are very informative to the uh, level and extent of apoptosis. So again, these are very quantitative assays. You're looking at uh, calibration curves for the three different panels right here, uh, down to nanograms per mil. So it isn't just relative Western blotting. This is really quite accurate. Quantitative assays calibrated to mass in concentration, nanograms per mil. Um, here you, we can show you some of the data for the precision, uh, sample linearity, and spike recovery. So interassay. Inter was determined by measuring three control samples, high, medium, and low, and replicates of 20 times over five runs with a minimum of two hours between runs. And you see the mean CV from the median control as shown. Uh, linearity is determined by diluting the sample over three dilution steps with assay buffer. And spike recovery is performed by spiking different amounts of the calibrator protein into lysate samples and then they're calculated as a percent of non-spiked or non-diluted lysate. And an average of four spike levels is presented here. So we have validation parameters for all these assays that are available on request. So here's some of the guidelines for what we need if we're to do testing. So we need 20 to 30 mgs of tissue from a xenograft, uh, and we have some notes here on the needle biopsy. If it's a cell pellet, the number of cells, uh, and then if we have the option of either we can process your sample, you send us just the frozen tissue, or we have two buffers available, a membrane extraction buffer and a cytosolic extraction buffer uh, for you to extract and send us uh, homogenous. And we have a protocol available for that. Uh, a lot of work went into that, and it's a pretty simple, robust protocol, and uh, that can be homogenized in any typical routine lab. So a lot of the validation was done, obviously, to immunoprecipitation Western blots. So here's what we can look at here. As we know, Western blotting is pretty uh, labor intensive, hard to do a lot of samples with Western blotting. And quantification of bands, as we know, densitometry is fraught with sort of problems and, uh, and errors. So you can see here uh, median fluorescent intensity coming right off the Luminex instrument and uh, uh, the protein concentration. And it correlates quite well with higher sensitivity than the Western blot. We're looking at total back here. And then actually on the right here, uh, um, BCLX back dimer. So in that case, for the Western, one has to immunoprecipitate with one member of the protein. And here you can see um, the IP antibody was anti-BCLXL. And then it's probed with back uh, for the for the Western blot. And then these also served as both the capture and the detection antibodies on the Luminex bead assay. So all assays, uh, again, will show some data on this, um, have this Western blot validation data. Uh, so no first antibody, negative control in the first lane. And then you can see uh, the back at the right molecular weight size. And we're looking at two samples here. Um, the uh, control and then the nuclear and mitochondrial membrane prep of PC3 cells 
and you can see the uh, median fluorescence intensity and how that correlates into nanograms per mil. And sample two is uh, induced with a BH3 mimetic. So as we can see, we can see a small increase here in apoptosis in sample three, sample two. Uh, here's a, an example of VAX total. Uh, we can see four samples here. Also, again, PC3 cells, uh, uh, both cytosol and nuclear membrane. And then we can see looking at a colorectal tumor, um, very high levels in the cytosol of VAX. And a VAX is known to exist in the cytosol. So even though it's highly upregulated in this case with little in the nuclear and mitochondrial membrane preparation. Uh, here's a cell culture model. We took Jercat T cell lymphoma and uh, treated them with uh, ABT199, which is another peptide B BH3 mimetic. So again, blocking the BCL2 anti-apoptotic proteins, allowing uh, a release of BAX and BAC to form their oligomeric mitochondrial um, um, complexes that lead to release mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization. And uh, if we looked at cell counts, we know we have, a, I think it was about 30% of protein of cells at three hours undergoing apoptosis and over 75% at 24 hours. So we can see even at three hours, CAS phase three, quite activated. This is a rather long time course. Uh, I think we, we'd see, we can see more subtle interactions if we did many more time points in this case. And we can see SMAC. The blue line is, um, is, is membrane, and red is cytosolic. Um, so we can see SMAP, SMAC decreasing quite late at 24 hours, uh, with surviving pretty stable over the time. And laminin B, the nuclear uh, membrane filamentous uh, membrane, showing that we have nuclear membrane breakdown uh, um, you know, quite, quite extensively at 24 hours. Looking at some more of the uh, players here, we see BCLXL going up uh, quite strongly in the membrane, um, an example of it probably being released and not unbound from back, uh, uh, backs. And then we can see the dimer here on the next slide, uh, BCLXL back, and then quite a decrease at 24 hours. And then also looking at MCL back, MCL1 prefers to bind back over backs we see the same pattern going on there. So we can see all three heterodimers here, whereas we can see membrane-wise it didn't really change much for the BACS uh, BCL2 fragment. Uh, we've also examined levels in colon tumors. Um, and what we're really looking at here, uh, blue, is adjacent sort of normal stromal tissue. And the um, Red bars here are the actual tumor tissue. And again, these are human, real human tissues from patients. Uh, not a statistical study here, but just a sampling of five different tumors. And sort of an overall theme here is you can see that many of the tumors really have varying levels of these proteins. Uh, so no one tumor is exactly alike. But we do see things such as uh, back upregulated and normal tissue for, let's say, tumor two. Uh, cytosolic bad in, 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 tissue, in tissue two, um, and, uh, and obviously the SMAC membrane bound. So SMAC is even upregulated in the tumor tissue, uh, yet it is. This is where it still it has not been released, obviously, since this is membrane bound SMAC. And then looking at some of the uh, uh, BCL and uh, uh, BCL and uh, mem members, including some of the dimers, uh, a very different situation here in, in tumor three, uh, highly upregulated BCLXL. Uh, so again, that makes sense, and that is you know blocking apoptosis, as we know the BCL uh, family members can be upregulated. Um, the heterodimer upregulated in that situation, also the BCLXL back. So we can see see that level quite high in three. And then MCL1 can be a bit more restricted. Uh, it's high in neutrophils. And we can see in the tumor tissues for, let's say, two, uh, very low levels in the bottom there. 
So an overall theme here is really profiling can give you quite a bit of information for a given tumor. And so with a larger statistical study, I think for these uh, activators of apoptosis, it's going to be extremely useful to know what the status is of a particular tumor and whether treatment is appropriate or not for that patient. Uh, here is an example of a xenograft model. This is a breast cancer xenograft model. And what we have here is uh, multiple treatments uh, with this SMAC mimetic. Again, so this would mimic the release of SMAC and being able to uh, activate apoptosis. We see two different doses. Uh, red is a higher dose. And there were seven treatment days, but on um, uh, for uh, dose one, it was treatment day one, we tumors were collected, and for dose three, uh, uh, treatment day seven, uh, tissue was collected. So we can see CAS phase three quite activated even after six hours. Uh, uh, a dose response higher in the uh, higher concentration, we can see vehicle control uh, quite normal through the whole range. And then even several days later, at post-dose 3, when you can imagine many of the cells, part of the tumor has already died, uh, there's still a response going. And on the right, the laminin B, uh, nuclear, uh, membrane, nuclear nucleus integrity intermediate filament protein marker, uh, fairly strong uh, at six hours, and has already sort of come down at 24 hours. And then post-3, not, not quite as strong in that sense. So here, uh, very good profiling of xenograft models, and one needs just a little bit of tissue. So uh, we wanted to leave a lot of time for, um, for questions. So that's really our summer, summary. So again, just to remind you, uh, the apoptosis map is available as a reference lab service and as kits, do-it-yourself kits on the XMAP platform and provides really a quantitative measurement of these 14 intracellular regulators and mediators of apoptosis, including the BCL family of anti-apoptotic heterodimers. And so examining the levels and changes of these proteins really can support the evaluation of drugs designed to regulate apoptosis in the treatment of cancer and inflammatory diseases. And thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions now. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Eisinger. That was a great presentation. Uh, it's really interesting to see the capabilities of that type of profiling method. At this point, I would like to uh, ask our audience to continue sending their questions and comments in right now using the questions window for this, which is the Q&A portion of the webinar. And um, Dr. Eisinger, I've, I've already received some questions, so I'm going to start with the ones we have here. Our first question. How does specificity for the particular protein compare to Western blotting methodology? Uh, can you expand on that a bit more? Yeah, as you can see, we really validated to Western blotting. And the great thing about um, sandwich immunoassays is you really have two antibodies. So at least for immunoprecipitation Western blot, you have two antibodies. You have a pull-down antibody, and then you have a probing antibody to probe the nitrocellulose filter. So it compares quite, quite well with that. Now, sometimes it's nice, since immunoprecipitation, Western blotting, is very laborious. There's two long steps, um, two different incubations, and then running the gel. Whereas this is all done at once with minimal sample uh, manipulations and handling and not having to quantitate. So the specificity is basically the same as an immunoprecipitation Western blot, and the specificity for these Luminex technology is higher than if one is just probing a Western blot without doing uh, um, an immunoprecipitation experiment. Right. OK. Thank you for that. Um, our next question here, what is the general procedure for cytosolic and membrane fractionation? Yes, again, there's two buffers. Um, so the first step is using the cytosolic extraction buffer. And that breaks the outer membrane um, and allows for an extraction of the cytosolic proteins. Uh, and then one pellets the membrane, uh, nuclear and mitochondrial membrane. And so one has a uh, soluble cytosolic fraction right there. 
and then taking that pellet, washing it once, and then adding the membrane extraction buffer, which is a little bit stronger uh, detergent to break up uh, those membranes, and that extraction, and then again a simple spin, and one really has the two uh, preparations. So a lot of work really went into uh, uh, building that those techniques to be robust with uh, um, buffers and compatibility that are well known uh, from the literature to preserve, let's say, heterodimers and physiological uh, interactions of the apoptotic proteins within the cell. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another question, what is the turnaround time for testing once we send samples to your reference lab? Yeah, it will be once a month. We will be, so it will be about a month depending on when your samples are sent in. So we are initiating our service with monthly testing. Whether you send just a couple samples in or a couple thousand samples, uh, you can guarantee to get results approximately once a month. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, our next question here, uh, how do you normalize between samples? Oh, yeah, um, uh, uh, by protein concentration. So we run or we recommend um, with the kit that one runs a total protein concentration, uh, typical, let's say, standard Bradford or PCA analysis. Uh, so we normalize to total protein. Okay, thank you. Um, have you tried to incorporate the uh, inhibitors of apoptosis proteins? Uh, yes, we do have one. Survivin is our one uh, inhibitor of apoptosis protein, key one. So there are several others, um, and, and, and as maybe in the future, if we expand this panel someday, we'll have more in it. But we do have that one. Okay, thank you for that. Um, our next question here, uh, what is ideal spike recovery in MAP assays? Is 70% to 130% a good range? Yeah, that's we generally, generally like to do that. Most of them fall into a 120-80. Um, there was one protein that uh, didn't, uh, uh, the laminin B, and that comes in many multiple fragments. It's a little bit uh, complicated. It's an intermediate filament protein also. Uh, so that one did not spike as well, but it had you know, good linearity and other characteristics. So we do report that data, uh, and even though it is quite a useful marker. Okay, thank you for that. Um, our next question. How, how do extraction procedures affect the assay recovery? Uh, maybe it must mean protein recovery or so. Um, it's quite quantitative, the extraction procedures. Um, so, you know, we've normalized and we know the recovery for all the different proteins, and uh, that's how these extraction procedures really were worked out quite well. And so we have quite a detailed protocol, protocol to follow to get the best extraction possible. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, our next question, what kind of marker do you use to make sure the fractionation is successful? Uh, yeah, so for fractionation to be uh, successful, um, one, I, I believe, let's say, uh, bad we know should be uh, cytosolically bound, and we have all looked at, I don't have it off the top of my head, but some, some standard proteins also, you know, that are known to be cytosolic and uh, membrane proteins. Okay. So, yeah, it was quite validated on that, and I think we'll have information that, on that on our white paper. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, our next question here. Uh, are you working on measuring BCL2 alone? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, we, we can see BCL2 alone, um, but we just felt there was more information to provide with BCL2, um, you, you know, with its heterodimer interaction in that sense. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here. What control samples uh, do you use for analysis? Uh, uh, well, we have several different cell lines in here uh, that are well known. To, that's sort of our main control samples that are well known uh, on how they behave over apoptosis. Um, so that's what a lot of the validation is, is too, is to cell lines that have you know been well studied and their apoptosis character characteristics are well known. Okay, um, I just got this question in, so um, I'm going to try to work my way through it. 
hopefully you can uh, expand on this because I'm not sure exactly what the audience member is asking. I see BioRad apoptosis panels contain cell lysate. Um, what what is it? Sorry, what it is cell? They, they're saying, uh, can I use this lysate after the expiration date? Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but uh, maybe you can expand on that. Um, they should have quite a long expiration date. Uh, most of the uh, most of the our, our cell lysates are lyophilized, uh, stored quite well. Um, so you know, like anything, probably one should be suspicious after the expiration date. But uh, this is such a new kit, I doubt anything's expired yet. Um, since BioRad just launched this probably about a month ago. Um, and if, if that particular person, had, please please send an email into. At the end of this, Andrew will give a uh, for more thorough answers on, on any of these questions. Please send us an email, and we'll address it more thoroughly. Great, yeah, and we'll uh, present that email uh, in a in our next slide here. Um, another question here: How do you assess the quality of the assay? Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, I mean, really, with those parameters that I listed to assess the quality from validating correlation to Western blot, which is really the gold standard of looking at these, and then all the uh, standard sort of parameters of precision, linearity, spike recovery, uh, cross-reactivity, and sensitivity. Uh, what, what, how low can we detect? Uh, and in just about most of these cases, we can go lower than a Western blot on what you can reliably scan and use densitometry to quantify from a Western blot. So the assay quality really fits into all about those 10 different types of parameters. And that is available uh, you know, from us with validation documents and BioRad uh, kit literature has very extensive um, uh, validation, the validation parameters and anybody can go examine. OK. Well, thank you, Dr. Isinger, for that. We had some great questions today. Um, we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you do have any further questions, as we mentioned, you can email uh, to this address showing on your screen right now, myriadrbmis at myriadrbm.com. And thank you, everyone, for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And a survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is appreciated as it'll help us improve our further webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speaker, Dr. Dominic Isinger. We hope that you found this conference informative today. Have a great day, everyone.